there's a threshold that the state attorney feels comfortable enough. Okay, now we have enough here to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they may have evidence against somebody, but they have to feel the confidence that they're going to win the case, that they have enough that they can argue to the jury, this is beyond a reasonable doubt, prove that he was guilty. Welcome to a special edition of Surviving the Survivor. The Dan Markell Murder with Carm on Crime. Carm, I'd be remiss. Uh, how are you feeling? I know you were battling uh, COVID as well as your beloved husband, my father. And uh, you guys are both feeling better? I actually was uh, battling you too because you totally decided that I am not sick and I should be treated uh, completely ignored. No empathy for my plight. Well, Carm, before you went uh, silent, um, You had a big exclusive interview with Georgia Kaplman, the prosecutor in the Dan Markell murder case. And there is no person that knows more about this case than the great James W., better known as Mentor Lawyer. Mentor Lawyer, how are you? And by the way, how I think I asked you, but how did you come up with the name Mentor Lawyer? It's catchy. Um, I actually love another channel uh, that does aviation uh, videos. It's called Mentor Pilot, also with a U. So I thought that it was smart to use the word mentor with a U because the spelling is unusual. It's not a proper spelling, but it also is catchy and is easier to find if you search on YouTube. Because if you just search mentor, you're going to find billions of mentors. But if you send, if, if you search mentor, <laughs> there's going to be very <laughs> few. So at the same time that I like that uh, YouTube channel, Mentor Pilot, I also saw a sketch from uh, Saturday Night Live where they were using the U, like color on every <laughs> single word. It was funny, funny as heck. So those two things just clicked at the same time. I said, okay, well, Mentor Lawyer, that's going to be it. I had some other channel names before, that just didn't feel right, but this one felt right. Well, I feel better now because I didn't want to have to break the news that he was spe- spending a spelling mentor wrong, but now he knows <laughs> that he's spelling it wrong. So I know I, I'm doing it. <laughs> Before we get cracking, um, we had tremendous engagement on the Georgia Kappelman episode, and that is in no small part due to Mentor Lawyer also helping promote it on his channel, for which we are grateful. But we now have um, a Patreon page up, and we are putting out a newsletter, especially for people interested in the Dan Markell murder case. So if you're listening to this now and you want to get that newsletter, just hit us up in our YouTube comments with your email and I'll make sure you get on that letter and we will get you updated. We also were in touch with Dan Markell's mother, the beautiful Ruth Markell. Uh, She has a book coming out in the not so distant future and she is going to speak to us as well. I'm sure she's going to speak to uh, James also. But James, um, yes. the Georgia Kaplan interview, I know you did a little thing and again, we appreciate it on your channel, but what was your biggest takeaway from, uh, the interview we had? Well, for the first takeaway is that you guys did a great job. I thought that you got her to smile quite a bit. You got her joking, uh, and you got a, you got a lot out of her. So I wanted to give compliments to you and your mom. I thought you guys had excellent questions. I'm sure that a lot of people, suggested questions to you guys, but you guys picked the right ones. And also you had some good questions in the spur of the moment that got some good information out of Georgia. More than I expected, honestly. So good job. Thank good job you. Thank you. When you hear some of the comments, you'll know that not yeah, everyone yeah, exactly. thought the same way it you did. It wasn't the universe of you. I've been in uh, broadcast news for 25 years, but Carmela got a beautiful taste of uh, hate mail and what we call trolls on the internet yelling at her. But no, I appreciate no, that. One of the <laughs> things is get that old woman off the, po- uh, uh, off call, the podcast. Off yeah. the podcast. Mentor, do you ever get... Uh, I, I, I see you only getting positive criticism. I can't imagine you getting any... No. No, no, I, I get I get hate stuff all the time. <laughs> so um, you know, I just you know brush it off. Yeah. So, but back, uh, so back to the news at hand. Well. What what I know one thing that was really newsworthy is Ms. Kappelman, Prosecutor Kappelman, said that she is not going to pursue the death penalty with that. Yeah, uh, that's with, on with my Carl notes. Adelson. Okay. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I mean, I have a, I have notes, and uh, I can go through them, and we can talk about them. So Charlie was. 
on at the beginning of my notes. So what was the interesting information about Charlie Adelson, who's of course sitting in jail. He's the only Adelson so far that has been charged in the case. So number one, of course, the fact that the prosecutors decided not to pursue the death penalty against him. I thought that the excuse given by Georgia, and it was only one of them. She said there are many factors, the main one being that they did not succeed in getting the death penalty against Sigfredo Garcia, who was the shooter. Now, you, when you asked the question, you brought up the same case that I had brought up during our discussion, which is the case of Teresa Sievers. And in that particular case, the, the actual killer with a hammer, by the way, not with a, with a gunshot, even worse, he didn't get the death penalty. But the guy who hired him, the husband, got the death penalty. So I don't think that uh, it is a good analogy to say just because the shooter we didn't succeed in getting the death penalty against the shooter. Now we should back up from seeking it against Charlie. But like I said before, I think maybe I've said it before, maybe I didn't, or I said it on the other show, that I think Denmark Hell's, um, Denmark Hell was against the death penalty. So overall, I think that the people who want justice for them don't particularly want the death penalty to be pursued. So I think that they're fine with that decision. And that may have played a role as well. She didn't say that, but that may have... And did did I hear you? I, I think I heard you correctly. You said that Dan himself was against the death penalty. Correct. Yes. Okay. Correct. Carm, did you have a comment? I see your hand raised. No, 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 no. I didn't raise my hand. I I heard the same thing that Dan Markel was against the death penalty, which does not surprise me. Um. Yes. Go ahead, James. The other thing about Charlie, two two a couple of things. She said that he's very well represented, which is not a surprise, of course. Uh, there was a good question from you guys about whether a deal was possible with him. And she said, yes, it is possible, but she didn't see any, any discussions or any, no indications that they were going to be looking for any kind of deal. She believed that this case is likely going to be going to trial. So all the indications that she's getting from opposing counsel is that this is going to be a contested case and it's going to go to trial. So likely we're going to see another trial in the case, which I think is good news. Um, then about Wendy, you guys had very good questions about Wendy. I, I thought it was very good that you guys asked that question here. What if she lied under oath when she took the stand under that subpoena from the state? Good question. And she answered it nicely. I like the fact that she explained that in her position, if it could be proven that she lied under oath, both the lie and the statement that she made um, while lying under a state subpoena could be used against her. So in general, you... When you get a state subpoena, whatever you say is not supposed to be used against you. But I guess it only applies if you're honest. So if you're dishonest, she explained that they may argue, okay, now we can use the statements against you in the, if, if, if there are any charges filed against her involving the murder of her ex-husband. And also uh, that she could be uh, pursued for perjury. But again, that's very unlikely, but it is possible. And she confirmed that. The other thing that I thought was interesting about Wendy, that um, obviously she mentioned that even if Wendy knew that Dan Markell was going to be murdered, that that's not enough, that they have to have proof that she actually did participate in some way in the murder. So I liked how, how she explained that, and I thought that that was a good part of the interview. Uh, about Katie... We know that the sentencing has been kind of moved. Usually happens within 30 days. They moved it to the end of July. So I think that that gives her time to think through uh, her options and maybe consider trying to cooperate. You guys had good questions about whether that's a possibility. And Georgia did say, yes, it is still possible. But that, excuse me, there will be credibility questions if she does try to make a deal. And and we're going to, we're going to get into that in a second, but we, again, uh, I want to give homage to our audience. They're fantastic. And like I said, we had a ton of engagement. So in, in just a moment or two, we're going to go through a whole bunch of your comments to us, both good and bad. But one thing that a lot of people brought up, James, is, and you just alluded to it, Katie is due in court, Magbanua, on July 29th. And as far as I know, Charlie Adelson has a court day on July 29th. What is going on for both of them those days? And is there any chance that they uh, 
past each other in that courtroom hallway yeah yeah um, very possible um so so the thing is that the judge assigned to the case he's not assigned to leon county uh, felony cases at this time he's assigned to another county but the chief judge of the second judicial circuit appointed him to preside over this particular case so because now he's presiding over charlie's and also katie's for his own convenience it made sense to put both hearings at the same time now yes Charlie does have the right to be present in person. It is very possible that he's going to be appearing by Zoom and not in person. For the sentencing, I'm pretty sure that Katie will be there in person. So it's not 100%, uh, you know, that they will meet each other there, but uh, it would be possible. I mean, he, there's many times when you have a case management conference like Charlie's going to have, what happens is that all the people before COVID, all the people that had the case management would be brought into the courtroom unless their appearance was waived and they would be all sitting like in the jury area or in a different area, different benches that they have there for the defendants. So yeah, they would be sitting nearby. And for those who are new to this whole case, because uh, we kind of take it for granted that you know what's going on, Katie Magbanua is the intermediary that was just convicted. Uh, of a life for a life sentence for murder um she basically connected charlie adelson to the hitmen that killed dan markell and obviously charlie adelson is going on trial next for first degree murder um and it's just interesting because katie and charlie dated and now they could see one another in the hall excuse uh, me sir uh, are you sure they were uh they they're Convicted of first degree murder. They were convicted, but I don't know. James? If... Yes. Um, so Katie was convicted of first degree murder. But what about she Charlie? Was convicted. Charlie has only been charged with That's first degree right. murder. You, you, you used the wrong terminology. Charlie. Oh, I, I, did I say Charlie convicted? I did yes. not mean that. I'm, Charlie I was charged. I had two hours of sleep last night. I, I, stand, yeah. I stand corrected. I stand but corrected. you had no COVID. Th Carm, thanks for correcting me. Farm, they don't like us joking in this. No, we stay true to our. So, so, so Katie has been just convicted of being the middle woman who supposedly arranged First degree murder. or who arranged the killing by Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera. The state hasn't yet proven beyond a reasonable doubt who hired Katie, but they allege that it was one or more of the Edelsons. And now, because they charged Charlie, they at a minimum allege that he was the person hiring. But just because she was convicted, it doesn't mean that they proved that Charlie was the person who hired her. They still have to do that at the trial against Charlie. Would, would he be uh, charged if they didn't have that testimony readily available to, to, to prove that? The enhanced that? video? Yeah. I mean. Okay. So, so there was already pretty much enough evidence, I think, beforehand to charge Charlie. And. The reason why they didn't charge him is complex. You alluded to the question of whether there was some influence from uh, Charlie's prior lawyers. There was also a former state attorney here who had made some negative statements about the case and about the validity of, of you know, how, how useful that whole Dolce Vita tape would have been with the jury here in Leon County. I think that what led to the charges against Charlie clearly was the fact that they were finally able to enhance those the video recording the audio portion so that they could present this to the jury in a more manageable way and that the jury could hear a lot of the incriminating statements by charlie adison that he made you know about himself so that was the main reason why he finally was charged but there was other evidence before there's evidence against donna as well they just want to have the, there's a threshold that the state attorney feels comfortable enough, okay, now we have enough here to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt. So they may have evidence against somebody, but they have to feel the confidence that they're going to win the case, that they have enough that they can argue to the jury, this is beyond a reasonable doubt, prove that he was guilty. She, so. she kept her cards kind of close to the vest about other future um, indictments, but um, what was your feeling about... Donna, do, do you feel like uh, one way or the other, any gut instinct about whether Kaplan may go after her next? 
I think that Georgia, what she said was that whoever was involved should be scared. And that um, she did not foreclose the possibility of additional charges in the case. But she also hasn't charged anybody else with all of the evidence that there is now, including the enhanced video. So what it will take is more evidence. And what she's saying in, in the interview is that she trusts the system and that the truth has a way to come out. So whether it will be Charlie talking or Katie talking or someone else talking, she believes that if there's more people involved, that that's going to come out and that they're going to be charged and face uh, justice. Yeah, because we did ask her, you know, we said it must be incredibly uncomfortable to be Wendy or Donna right now, knowing right. that the uh, long arm of the laws is coming for you. And she, again, like you, you just mentioned, James, she didn't come right out and say it, but she said that they have reason to be afraid. If you read between the lines, um, I wouldn't be too comfortable if I was either of them. Right. And, and you know, all the, the bump after the bump, that operation in South Florida that involved the Tallahassee Police Department and the FBI, there was evidence and the new evidence against Harvey, um, Charlie primarily, and Donna primarily. So Donna and Charlie were the main people against whom more evidence was collected through that operation. Not really much against Wendy. So um, from for Wendy, it would be all of those coincidences, all the things that happened. You had a good question about that, that Georgia couldn't answer. But all of the coincidences and all the weird stuff that happened around the time of the murder James. involving Wendy. James, I want to to hear your most honest uh, reaction to. Uh, I felt a little funny afterwards. I thought I have a lot of gold to say this. That I said, you know, so far you did half of the job, uh, Georgia. I said you you got the low hanging fruit. I use that analogy. You know, you got uh, uh, Garcia Rivera and uh, and uh, Magbanua, but. Now comes the the harder part of the 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 case. The other three. I agree that it is the harder part because, you know, you still don't have a cooperating middle uh, person, right? The person in the middle, who was acting as the shield. So we don't know if if she has cooperated or not. Georgia does, but so far the indications are that she hasn't. You know, she's still set for. Her sentencing at the end of July. Georgia did mention that the judge has no discretion on count one, some kind of suggesting that the sentence will be life in prison, so that there's no deal yet, right? So, yeah, the case is going to be the hardest, I would say, against the Adelsons, because they're not directly connected to the murder, but you have to prove that they were the people who ordered it, and there was four people who had the motive and the money that they could have ordered it. Let's say Mag Vanua sticks to her story and doesn't say anything. Isn't there enough evidence in her huge pile of evidence that besides Charlie, there were other family members worked with Charlie? The evidence right now points to Charlie being involved points to Donna being involved, for sure. I think that arguably there is evidence to suggest that Wendy had knowledge and may have been involved as well. Again, the state hasn't charged anybody other than Charlie. So the state still doesn't feel that even if there is evidence against Donna or against Wendy or against Harvey, for them it's not enough yet for them to feel the confidence that they can prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. James. Now, I, yeah, there, there, there may be evidence pointing to others. And some of that is, is you know, a thing that it's not, it's a one-sided view of the evidence. We don't have Wendy's response. We don't have Donna's response to whatever we see, right? So they may be able to find ways to explain away some of that evidence that we think points to them. And James, um, I'm not a lawyer. You are. Uh, the state, obviously, you know, they, this is a high stakes game and the state wants to win. So there is a chance that as we're speaking right now, the state is talking to Katie, right, to try to cut a deal. Are they also able to go back to Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera right now? And how does that work? I'm actually curious. Like, does Georgia Kappelman 
physically go to the jail and sit down with Katie Magabanu and say, do you want to cut a deal? How does all this play out? It usually goes the other way around. Usually it would be uh, somebody sitting in prison. For example, Sigfredo Garcia may reach out to the state of Florida, to the prosecutor, send the letter saying, hey, listen, I want to talk. I want to cooperate, so on and so forth. I have some information that can be useful to you guys. And usually they will be represented, sometimes not, but they will then try to do a proffer. They will do a proffer. The state attorney then meets, and they may send first an investigator from the state attorney's office. And then if the investigator feels that there's something there, then the prosecutor may meet with the person who's trying to make a deal. And yeah, it can happen even after a conviction. If you suddenly become a witness for the state and help secure a major conviction, there may be something worked out where they vacate the former sentence or the judgment or conviction. And they, they, there's always a way to deal. I, I have a question. Legal, legally, let that when that, there was an episode, this is a parenthesis, there was an episode where uh, Charlie and Dana are having a conversation where, where Charlie really complains about Wendy, how she, she is always the lucky one, she gets away with things, she's a trust, for, uh, trust uh, fund baby, she has it easy in life, he had to struggle for everything. He, he has this long lamentation on the phone. Yeah. Like, I heard that. Now, I heard it too. Now, in light of this, Wendy, let's say it's discovered that Wendy knew about the murder but didn't plot, plan, or or participate in the in the in the setup of the murder. Mm -hmm. Just But she knew it was but gonna she happen. knew it and she didn't tell anybody she knew it. Does that make her complicit? Yeah. There are very narrow circumstances where knowing that a crime is going to occur can make you liable for the crime. Those are situations where you have some um, duty towards that person. So, for example, husband and wife or maybe parent and child. So they were exes. I don't think that you can, um, that you can find they're liable because there was no relationship at the time. Interesting. But legally, although, although argue, arguably, I mean, a lawyer can argue anything, right? <laughs> so she has an obligation to the children, and this is the father of her children, and murdering the father of her children will have uh, harmful effects to the children. So maybe you can argue that. <laughs> you can argue that knowing that somebody's going to kill the father of your children makes you responsible. But I think Georgia was backing off of that. She was saying, no, you have to prove that there was some participation. So, James, I want to get our audience involved, and the best way to do that is through comments. So if I can indulge you, I think what we should do is I'm going to rip through some comments, and re I'll read you the comments, and you tell me your reaction. Uh, or if they're asking a legal question, you can give that, and then we'll uh, get whatever else you think uh, was important out of that, and we'll, and we'll wrap this bad boy up. But let's start with uh, Angela. She says, I want to have a drink with Carm. She's right again. This case does have, quote unquote, epic dimensions like a Russian novel with disastrous moral and psychological consequences that result from murder, namely the Adelsons, who are now social pariahs suffering in their Miami high rise cell. Are the Adelsons basically trapped, in a sense, now as social pariahs, James? I think that comment says it very well. So, yeah. <laughs> sure. On to the next one. Bernard G. Please continue on with the Adelson case. It is as good as any Tom Clancy whodunit novel. Plenty of twists and turns, hoping all guilty parties are hung out to dry in the end. Is that what is the appeal here, James, is that it is like a Tom Clancy novel? Um, should people take a step back and realize that this was an actual human being who was murdered? Do people get too caught up in the drama, James? Uh, you know, we have murders happen all the time. And to me, I think that the victim is obviously some, you know, it's interesting that this was a professor, somebody who dedicated his whole life 
to studying, to being as best as he could be, that was, you know, murdered in essence by his exes and his fa- the ex-wife's family over custody issues. I mean, yeah, th- there's a lot of uh, dilemmas in this case, a lot of uh, interesting issues, the whole, you know, drama before the murder that was happening between the two um, very liked spouses, liked at the law school, liked in town, a lot of friends. But yeah, they had this... Uh, By the way, uh, I listened, I watched... Horrible the, divorce. The, your movie, your movie, which is on YouTube, The Hitman Option, and I, wa- yeah. I watched it, and I didn't know you were such a good actor. You had this perfect Southern <laughs> accent, and the, 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 the one who played Wendy was, you, I agree with you, pretty and a good actress. And after a while, I forgot it wasn't Wendy. Uh, so <laughs> I enjoyed very much. I recommend it. Mentor lawyer does not mess around. On to the next comment from Sophia Lavish. Love the name. She says, and trust me, they're not all like this. The other ones are coming in a second. She says, love, love, love this YouTube channel. Brilliant interview. Followed by KK, who says, great interview. Love Georgia. Please ask her, number one, if she noticed that Wendy wore the exact same outfit in both trials. If she did notice, what does she think was the purpose or idea behind doing that? Why, James? Would Wendy wear the same exact outfit? And did you notice that? Yeah, I noticed it. I'm sure since Georgia noticed that uh, that Wendy Edison was wearing the owl shirt in her interrogation, I think that Georgia also noticed that uh, that Wendy was wearing the same outfit, exactly the same outfit, at the second trial as she did in the first trial. I, I had people. Uh, bring that up and comment. I don't think I noticed the, the moment it was happening, but uh, later when I guess I was watching the video and editing and putting it up on the YouTube, I did notice. And then other people brought it up. And their suggestions were uh, that maybe she didn't want she she didn't want anybody to uh, to watch it. Basically, they would see Wendy with that dress and think, oh, this is the first trial, so I'm not going to watch it. You know, they get confused. Uh, the other, the other uh, idea that I had was just uh, maybe this is her lucky dress, and she felt that she, uh, you know, she did well the first trial. So maybe uh, I'll wear the lucky dress again. <laughs> Carm, you're the woman here. I Any think, thoughts? I think she did it to confuse the enemy. That you don't know if this is now. Wait a minute. Is this the first trial or is this the second trial? Good, good theory. On to a comment from LJ. Fantastic interview. Notice that Georgia explicitly did not rule out Katie Magbanua still cooperating. Yes, yes, yes. We know there would be credibility issues. But again, Katie Magbanua apparently still could cooperate. Sleep well, Charlie. We kind of went over that. That is a definite possibility, right, James? It, it is a possibility. Uh, I also I like the fact that Georgia said that she didn't have uh, a drink with the opposing counsel after this trial. So the relationship with the opposing counsel is not very good. It is possible that Katie will switch attorneys if she wants to cooperate. So we'll have to see. So far, you know, it looks like the same attorneys are involved. It's interesting how people, I mean, I it's true. She did say that she did not have a drink uh, this, this go around, but she has in the past. So read into it what you want. Now, another one, Comment here from William Powers. For fiction writers, the Dan Markell case may offer a learning experience as well as a strategy opportunity. Wendy Adelson wrote a novel during the marriage, which Dan Markell didn't even read, telling her, I don't read fiction. This case has many fascinating twists and turns. So that little tidbit just goes to show you some of the strain in the marriage, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of strain in that marriage it, towards the end. And, uh, you know, the Hitman option, when it's done, it's not done yet. Uh, the parts that are coming from the movie are the most interesting parts, uh, which is, you know, when there's more discussion about the relationship and about the disputes that were ongoing during the divorce proceedings about the children, about, you know, there's there was an argument about the fact that I think Dan wanted, I think it was, it was a Halloween party, and Dan had been invited, and Wendy 
um, was supposed to go there with the children, but then didn't go, did not bring the children. So that became an, an issue. So basically, in the later parts of this movie that is still being done, edited, there's a lot more um, insight into the troubles of the relationship. The tease for the movie. On to Randy Orr, spelled O-R-R. And here we go, James. Interviewers are immature and unprepared. Frustrating to listen to un- to listening. Frustrating to listening. Spell it right, Randy, if you're going to put me down. To unserious people on such a serious case. And why are you asking Georgia if you heard about a judge that had her son murdered? What kind of question is that? I brought that up because we were discussing the dangers that prosecutors face in uh, prosecuting I, felons. But uh, I thought it was a great question. <laughs> oh, thank you, James. There you go, Randy Orr. On to the next. I think I disagree. I disagree. I disagree. Let me disagree with Randy Orr. (laughs) (laughs) So I thought that, first of all, uh, I think that, you know, every case is very serious. Every murder case is serious. And, you know, the interview and the approach that you guys have, I try to bring it up sometimes. And some people take offense on it. I think that I've tried to make, um, you know, the, the Hitman Option movie a little bit funny, you know, with my accents or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, this is all part of life. Uh, I think that anything that brings focus to the case is helping bring justice. There are a lot of cases that have no attention whatsoever. So I think that whatever way you find to bring attention to a case, to bring pressure on the prosecutors, on the defense and everybody to do a good job, whether it is through humor or whichever way, is positive. So. That's a negative comment. I would like to see it as a positive. You guys did a great job in the interview. Well, you got her you. smiling. So good job. Thank you. If I may say so myself, I feel like Georgia Kaplman enjoyed it. Um, on to M. Martin. I really wish I had of sent a comment. This is I'm reading this verbatim, so it sounds weird. I really wish I had of sent in a comment to give the prosecutor. I have stumbled. Keep in mind, people are watching this around the world, so their English might not be the first language. Arm. Okay, I can relate to that. I have stumbled upon something of significance that may aid in the future indictments of the Adelsons, and that bit of information relates to the former roommate friend of Charlie's meeting with Wendy. This started all of a sudden this year. Very peculiar. I have no idea what he's talking about or she, but do you, James? Yes. He's talking about Dr. Obed. Dr. Obed was listed as a witness. He was the former roommate of Charlie Adelson. And this is somebody who claims to have some evidence. So they need to reach out to Georgia Kappelman. They can do that. She's a, a, you know, works for a state attorney's office. It's easy to look her up on Google and send her an email. So do that or contact the investigators. Another comment from Richard Hybels. Georgia, I think I'm one of your biggest fans. Obviously, he's speaking to Georgia Kappelman directly. My favorite moment in the three tra- trials, Georgia Kaplman to Wendy Adelson, are your parents rich? And she says, are you asking me to speculate? And Georgia Kaplman mm. says, no. What, what was the drama involved in that? Now, first of all, Richard Hybels is a super cool guy. He's been a long-term supporter of my channel as well. So, uh, and he watched many of the... See, the, the interesting thing in my, in my, in my channel is that I have several trials that involve Georgia Kaplan as the prosecutor. So there's the Hoyt Burge murder. There's the this case against a serial killer called Gary Michael Hilton from way back when she was much, much younger. And there's the Samra Frash murder case. So she's, you know, a lot, a lot of the people that follow my channel really love Georgia Kaplan. That's why he's talking directly to her. And yeah, yeah, there was, a, there was quite a bit of drama in the examination of Wendy Adelson uh, in both trials. Nice. Um, but but why was it important? Is, is are her parents rich? Out of context, I don't understand. Why, why why is it important, James, to point out that her family is wealthy from a legal strategy? I think I think it was. Yeah, this is a murder for hire situation, right? So the 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 implication was that the rich people were hiring some. Um, you know, gangsters or whatever, low life people or like less, less fortunate people to do the, the to do the dirty work for them. Exactly. <laughs> Next comment from Let It Snow. These are all yellow exclamation marks followed by 
important message for Georgia, exclamation mark. When you're questioning the defendant, please do not keep saying, right, okay, this sounds like you agree with her. Not only are we getting criticism, but now Georgia's getting criticism. Is it a bad um, habit or language tick, if you will, James, to say right and okay? Yeah, it is a criticism that is valid. It is a criticism that actually, if you watch a lot of trial lawyers, Almost everybody does it. Everybody falls in that trap, including me. I have a trial of mine on my channel, and the judge has called at me for <laughs> saying, okay, well, all right, after every answer that I got from a witness. Yeah. So but, uh, it happens quite a bit. I, thought, I, I always thought, tell my kids, small words are big words. Go on, go no, on. No offense, and, and it's not attack on masculinity, but it's mostly a woman's issue that, you, you know, it's like the valley girl, you know, uh, ending the sentence with a question in, in everyday conversation, uh, uh, do you agree with me? And in, in the, in the cross-examination, like saying, uh, saying you're right, yes, it's like, mm. you know, like being like the nurturing mother type, you know? Well, no, let, let, me, let me explain what, she, what this comment is about. Let me explain it, okay? Because every when you're doing a cross examination, it's perfectly normal to make a statement, say, and you were and you're guilty, correct? You always finish with that question, like correct or isn't it true or something like that, because all you want is a yes or no answer. What this question is about is something different. When you ask somebody an open question and then the witness answers it, says yes, I went home that day and I was wearing a dress and I was driving my red car, whatever. And then after the person finishes, the prosecutor would say, okay, or all right, and then ask the next question. So what the comment is, she shouldn't say, okay, or all right, after the witness answers, because you're kind of saying, okay, I agree with you. That's what the comment is about. It's about that word after the person answers the question before the next question the prosecutor puts a word in there it's kind of like what a, should what okay, should well, the prosecutor say then should be silent you know even i like i said i made the same mistake as a defense attorney or as a prosecutor but the, what we would try to do when we ask the questions we want to keep a clean record so we ask a question the person answers and then we just silent wait find the next question in our outline and ask that question and not say okay or all right or some kind of comment to the answer silence is golden on to the next comment we're going to fly through a few more of these and we're going to wrap it up the next one is from veronica empudia i cannot believe you had georgia kaplman as a guest for almost an hour and you wasted all good opportunities to ask her good questions instead of making bad jokes no one cares about there were so many missed opportunities to ask her so many things that we would have liked to know. She is one of the best prosecutors in the state, and we are all on edge about this case. Oh, frustrating. I was going to try to make a joke, but I couldn't think of one. Uh, James? There's, there's significant limitations to what Georgia could say, and your, uh, and your efforts and your smooth, funny way of getting to them got a lot of answers from her that I did not expect. So I, again, will repeat, you guys did a great job. So there, Veronica. No, 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 but you should you should say to Veronica, darling, why don't you write down the questions? Because she said she's coming back. Veronica, she's coming back. So write the questions. We will <laughs> yeah, ask and make sure you uh, give us your email so I can send you my newsletter um, with a little kiss emoji. Stephen Karras, who I'm getting to know through this podcast, who just asked how Carm was feeling. Very kind of you, Steve says, you and Karm are the gifts that keep on giving. Maybe this is why I like him so much. He says, nice work. Come on my po podcast called the Schmooze Button, because we have the main schmooze and new schmooze instead of the snooze button. Shout out to the Schmooze Button. Um, on to the next one from William Powers. As to how Catherine Magbanua is paying her legal fees, it's not the Adelson family members. The judge held an in-chambers meeting on the issue, and he stated that her fee source is not related to Adelson's. One must note that Magbanua's sister-in-law currently charged with embezzlement of over $1 million in an unrelated case. That is where Catherine's legal fees source could be traced. 
Is that true, James? Who 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 made that comment? The comment comes from William Power. Bill no, but, Power. But he says that Mark Banua's uh, sister-in-law has a million this, dollars. Yeah, this person is suggesting, in a sense, that that he knows what was said inside the chambers when there was a discussion with the judge. I think that the prosecutor answered the best. I mean, I think that there was an in-chambers discussion with the judge about whether or not whoever Spain for the defense of Catherine McManua created a conflict of interest and the judge felt comfortable that the defense attorneys were not being compromised. That's different than saying that the money is coming from Katie's sister or sister-in-law or whoever. Okay, so the fact that the sister-in-law is in prison because she committed embezzlement around the same time doesn't mean that she used the embezzled money and risked her own freedom to help Katie. That doesn't make any sense. So if there was a member of the Katie McManua family funding this humongous defense, that would have been all over the news. They would have used the media to make that known to everyone. That's my position. Interesting. Because they have been using the media to defend Katie all the time. And that would have been something that says, look, here's this poor woman, and she has her family committing crimes to try to defend this innocent lady. Okay? They would have, that would have come out. So to me, it's more logical to conclude that there was some way that, that they funded this defense, that somebody who was involved in the murder funded the defense that was indirect and, and they could not be traced. How much would you say Paul Park we won't hold you to it. I just have no idea. Um, how much would it be to defend Katie Magbanua uh, until now? It, would it be like upper six figures or lower six figures? I, I would say that these lawyers are very, very competent. They have a high hourly rate, likely, excuse me, you know, in the 300 to 500 an hour rate range, and that uh, they devoted thousands of hours in the case. Do so, the math, Carm. Do a the lot math. of money. A lot of money. I'll do it with a calculator. My favorite comment comes from Olivia <laughs> Shuey. I like this, but I wish the male in this podcast would shut up and quit being so condescending towards that lovely coho. Mate, you are the most irritating thing I've seen in a podcast. Totally took away from the podcast. Olivia, I'm married. Otherwise, I would date you. On to the next. Uh, no, wait, wait, I have a comment about oh, that. Oh, please. please. I mean, this, please. this show is called Surviving the Survivor. <laughs> so, so the son is surviving his mom, and apparently that's the way that he survives. <laughs> so, <laughs> if, I'm ever, if I'm ever in trouble, I'm calling, I'm calling James. <laughs> to defend you against <laughs> little me. And I'm not as sweet a little thing that, you know, like I, I'm a tough cookie myself. Carm, all the comments were like, leave the old lady alone. I am a tough cookie. Everyone said, leave the old lady well, that's alone. That's why he has to survive you. That's why he's surviving <laughs> that's right. the survivor. It's I not, a, not for nothing that he chose this title. He's, right. he's struggling <laughs> to survive me. One of my favorite commenters and people who I've never met, but I'd love to one day, is Got Donuts? Question mark. Georgia Kappelman is a stellar prosecutor who firmly believes that the truth has a way of coming out, which is interesting. James made that point, too. Her commanding knowledge of the law has brought about the truth as to the guilt of Katie, Sigfredo, and Lewis. Charlie is next to feel the legal wrath of Georgia in heels. Go, Georgia, go. They all admired her high heel shoes. They all yeah. sure did. Um, and then here's a final comment, and then we will wrap it up. Two final comments. I'll end with this. You've got a new subscriber. This is from Patty L. Great interview with wonderful questions. Georgia is tops. I so appreciate the job she does, the risk she takes being a prosecutor. So well done. Georgia, congratulations. Look forward to the trial coming up from Char for Charlie, Charlie Adelson. Go get him, Georgia. And last and final comment. This is for Georgia herself. I hope Ms. Kappelman will read the comments because I want her to know I have watched her closing statements five times. She's so amazing. James, is Georgia Kappelman uh, a level above other prosecutors? Yeah, yeah. I think that she's a really, really good prosecutor. 
uh, maybe not the best ever, uh, but definitely at the at the top of her game and uh, very talented. Actually, we have two very talented top level prosecutors uh, here at the second judicial circuit that I really like, and also we have up and coming Sarah Dugan, who I really liked her both in the Henry Segura trial and in this trial. So we we feel lucky to have uh, several very strong prosecutors in the second judicial circuit. Now, I've watched a lot of trials, and so I'll put her at the very top five of hundreds that I've observed. So You need to. Sure. We, we need to get her back. Um, James, otherwise known as Mentor Lawyer, thank you so much. This was awesome. Um, anything you want to add before we wrap this up? Yeah, let me just take a quick look at my list. Uh, there was... There was one thing I liked that Georgia said was the fact that she watched the interview that I did with one of the jurors. So basically, jurors that speak after a trial, they are very, very helpful to the system, both to the prosecutors and to the defense. I do encourage people who serve as jurors to agree to do interviews. And we actually do a good job of trying to protect their privacy. When I did my interview of a juror, I protected her privacy, I did not show her face, did not give out her name. Uh, but yet, the information that we get from those interviews is really awesome for everybody involved in the system and to make the system better. So I'm glad to hear that that I did it and that Georgia watched it and she prepared for the second trial. I think that for the jury selection, keeping that in mind, you know, some of the things that were discussed in that um, interview. And, uh, and the other thing I really liked was the fact that Georgia mentioned one thing. We had discussed this in our previous, previous uh, video about the case, the fact that I had filed a motion because I wanted the phone calls released between Sigfredo Garcia and other people, including the defense attorney, Tara Kawas, and the judge had sealed everything. So I was really excited to hear, and I don't know how you got it out of her, but she mentioned the fact that she the state is going to be filing a motion to release those. And that's great. That's, uh, that's going to be awesome for the case to have that information. And James, no doubt that uh, Georgia Kappelman is a, either an, an open or a se secret subscriber to Mentor Lawyer. She's keeping tabs on <laughs> me, man. I know for a fact. Yeah, I'm a always a somebody to join a, the channel. A closet a subscriber. Watcher, closet subscriber. Absolutely. Closet subscriber. Absolutely. But I, I have to tell you that now I feel like I really know you better. Uh, and I, what I love about you is that you love what you're doing. You can feel the passion. Well, thank you. Yeah, you that's what I love. And for all those who think that James, a.k.a. Mentor Lawyer, just studies trials and this all day long, you're wrong because he's like, I got to go because I'm going to play tennis. And down the road, <laughs> yeah. James and I will have... A tennis match. We will put that on YouTube for all the uh, for Dan sure. Markel. Yes. What What is your level? My, uh, so not you, very you know. good anymore. I used. No, to, I, he's finished. He's, I'm finished. You're gonna I, beat oh, yeah, him, yeah. guaranteed. No, I was. I was a three time <laughs> state champion in New Jersey in high school. That was thirty there years you go. ago. So 30, in, high he school, be in high yeah. school. In high school. So so he he's gonna be a practiced. tough challenge for me. Yeah, that's when my mother used to be nice to me and. She would come with a cooler and wave an American flag. <laughs> awesome. I watched him. I was the good mommy. And I, I, once they won, I saved the ball. I had it for a long time. Karma, I would keep awesome. it tight because people are going to say, how come you're talking about your son's tennis during a Georgia Kappelman recap? Anyway, <laughs> this I'm, sa is I'm, sa I'm saving all of you. So listen, uh, mentor lawyer, you're, as my mother would say, a gentleman and a scholar and a mensch. Thank you so much for joining us once again. And obviously, we're going to do this hopefully many more times as we progress through this Dan Markell murder case. I'm um, hoping you guys will come for an interview on my channel as well. So 100%. We'll, we'll have to set that up. Love right. that. Love you, America. Awesome,